Hello and welcome to Bob's Programming Academy. In this tutorial, we will teach you how to build a portfolio website for a freelance developer using Bootstrap 5. Building an impressive portfolio is one of the best things you can do to land your first client as a freelance developer. A modern and elegant portfolio website allows you to showcase your projects and demonstrate your skills, experience and services to potential clients. This is the project we are going to build. At the very top, we have a header with a logo and a menu. Below the logo and menu, we have a hero section with an image, a short description and two buttons. Next, we have the about section. In this section, you can introduce yourself, describe your skills and experience and the services you offer your clients. This section is split into three columns. Next, we have the Projects section. Each project includes an image, a project name, a description, tags, and a link to a GitHub repository that we can access by clicking the source code link. Next, we have the Testimonials section. In this section, you can show your potential clients what other people have said about your work. This section is split into three columns. Finally, we have the contact section. A map in this section is created using a leaflet library. Leaflet is an open source JavaScript library for creating mobile friendly interactive maps. It's a good alternative to Google Maps since it's completely free. This portfolio website is fully responsive and it looks great on devices of all sizes. This is what the project looks like on an iPhone 12 Pro. This is an iPad mini. This is what the project looks like on a Nest Hub Max. We are going to build this portfolio website using Bootstrap 5. Bootstrap is a free and open source front-end framework for faster and easier web development and is a great choice when we want to quickly build responsive and mobile-friendly web applications. Bootstrap includes HTML and CSS-based design templates for a grid system, spacing, typography, and various components such as buttons, forms, tables, navigation, alerts, and so on. Bootstrap also includes JavaScript plugins that allow us to easily add to our websites models, popovers, tooltips, off-canvas menus, toggle-able hidden elements, and more. JavaScript in Bootstrap is HTML first, which means that we can use JavaScript just by adding data attributes to our HTML elements, since nearly all of Bootstrap's JavaScript plugins include a data API. So, without further ado, let's get started. To build this project, you need a code editor. My favorite is Visual Studio Code, which is free and easy to install and has important features such as support for IntelliSense code completion, debugging and code refactoring. I will be using Visual Studio Code in this tutorial. To download and install Visual Studio Code, go to https colon slash slash code dot visual studio dot com. From within Visual Studio Code, we can also install various extensions that can speed up our work and improve our productivity. In this tutorial, we will be using the Live Server extension to launch a local development server that allows for a live reload of our project. To install Live Server in Visual Studio Code, go to Extensions and in the search field type Live Server. Next, press the Install button. Now, let's create a directory where we will keep our code. In Visual Studio Code, go to Explorer and click Open Folder. Next, navigate to the location where you want to create a new folder and click the New Folder button. Next, type the name of the project folder 
and click Create. I will call the project folder Portfolio Website. Once you've created the project directory, click Open. Next, we need to create project files. We will need three files, one for our HTML code, one for CSS, and one for JavaScript. In Visual Studio Code, press New File and add a file called index.html. Next, press New Folder and add a folder called CSS. Inside that folder, add a file called styles.css. Next, press New Folder and add a folder called JS. Inside that folder, add a file called scripts.js. Let's also add a folder for images that we are going to use in our project. If you want to use the same images as we do in this tutorial, you can find them in the project's GitHub repository. The repository is linked in the description section below. Ok, we've just created all the files we will need for this project. First, we will focus on the index.html file. HTML or hypertext markup language is a language we use to describe the structure of a web page that is text, forms, buttons and other parts of the web page that users ultimately see and interact with. An HTML page consists of text-based code we write that a web browser such as Chrome, Firefox or Safari can look at, parse, understand and display to the user. CSS or Cascading Style Sheets is a language we use to describe the style of a web page that is the colors, fonts, layouts and spacing that make the web page look exactly the way we want it to look. JavaScript is a very powerful programming language that we can use to make our web applications more interactive. JavaScript also gives us the ability to directly manipulate DOM elements. DOM is an acronym for Document Object Model. The Document Object Model is a programming interface for web documents. It represents the document as a tree-like structure with nodes that describes how all of these HTML elements are related to each other. That way, programming languages such as JavaScript can interact with the page and dynamically change its structure, style and content. Ok, let's start with a simple HTML5 structure. I will add the doc type and the HTML tag. In the head section, I will add two meta tags and a title of portfolio website. Inside the body, I will add a heading that says hello world. An HTML page is structured as a series of nested HTML elements where an HTML element describes something on the page and we might have elements that are inside of other elements. Each of those elements is indicated by what we call an HTML tag enclosed using angle brackets. The majority of elements in HTML have an opening and a closing tag. A few, like the meta tag for example, are self-closing tags. We open our document with a doc type declaration. It's a way of telling the web browser what version of HTML we are using on this particular web page. Duck type HTML means that this page is written using HTML5, which at the time of making this tutorial is the latest version of HTML. After the duck type declaration, we open the HTML tag. It's the root tag for our document, which indicates the beginning of the HTML content of our page. In the HTML tag, we can also specify an HTML attribute that provides some additional information. Here, we use the lang attribute to specify the language for the document. In our case, it's English. Inside the HTML tag, we have a number of different elements that describe what we want on this page, starting with the head section of the page, which provides information about the page that will be useful for web browsers. In the head section, we first use a meta tag to specify the character encoding, which tells the web browser 
how to parse the information contained within our page. Unless we have a good reason to specify otherwise, the value of the car set will typically be UTF-8. The second meta tag is a viewport meta tag. It tells the web browser how to render our page and makes our page more mobile friendly. It says make the content render at 100% of the width of all supported mobile browsers. Next we have the title of our web page. The body of an HTML page is indicated by a body tag. The body of the page is its visible part, the part that users ultimately see and interact with. Inside the body tag, we have a heading that says hello world. You can think of HTML headings as titles or subtitles that you want to display on a web page, like a headline that describes what the page is about. HTML headings are defined with the H1 to H6 tags. H1 defines the most important heading and H6 the least important. Ok, let's check what our page looks like now. We will use the live server extension that we've just installed to launch a local development server that will allow for a live reload of our page. To start the server, click go live here in the bottom right corner of the status bar in Visual Studio Code. This action will load our web page in your default web browser. The page now displays the text hello world. If you are wondering, 127.0.0.1 is the IP address for localhost, which is your local computer. The 5500 after the colon is the listening port for our server and after the slash we have index.html which is our web page. In Visual Studio Code, in the bottom right corner of the status bar, instead of the text go live, we can now see port colon 5500. To stop the server, click on this text you will see again the text go live, which indicates that the live server is not currently running. Now we can start working on the structure of our page. First, let's link the three files so that our HTML page can use the CSS code from the styles.css file and the JavaScript code from the scripts.js file. We can include a CSS file in an HTML page by adding a link tag in the head section of the page. This link tag must contain a rel attribute that specifies a relationship reference to the stylesheet. The second attribute we need to add is the href, which indicates a hyperlink reference and should point to the URL of our CSS file. What you can see here above the link tag is a comment. The comment tag in HTML is denoted by the left angle bracket exclamation mark dash dash and dash dash right angle bracket. Anything that appears between the comment tag is ignored by the web browser. Comments can be added at any point within the head and body sections of an HTML page. Next, we need to include the scripts.js file within our HTML page. To do that, we add a script tag in the body section of the page. We should add it just before the closing body tag and all the other HTML tags we are about to add should be placed above the script tag. The script tag must contain an src attribute pointing to the URL of our JavaScript file. You might be wondering why we've added the script tag at the bottom of the body section and not at the top or not in the head section. The reason for this is that HTML loads from top to bottom. The head section is loaded first, then the body section, and then everything inside the body. If we put our JavaScript in the head section, the entire JavaScript code would be loaded before any of the HTML elements in the body, which could cause a few problems. Let's say that we have code in our JavaScript file that changes some HTML element on the page. 
If the JavaScript code is loaded before the HTML elements in the body section of the page, the element that our JavaScript code should modify would not be available yet. As a result, the JavaScript code would appear not to be working and we would get an error. Another problem is when we have a lot of external JavaScript files and we link them in the head section. This can visibly slow down the loading of our page. This would happen because all of the JavaScript would be loaded before any of the HTML elements. When we place our JavaScript at the bottom of the body section of the page, it gives the HTML time to load before any of the JavaScript is loaded. This would prevent errors and speed up our website's response time. Ok, let's also link Bootstrap and the font and icons we will use in this application. First, search for Bootstrap 5 download and select the first link in the search results. It should be this one here. You can download Bootstrap from getbootstrap.com and host it yourself, or you can include Bootstrap from a CDN. CDN stands for Content Delivery Network, and it refers to a geographically distributed group of servers that work together to provide fast delivery of internet content. In this tutorial, we will include Bootstrap from a CDN. There are several benefits of using a CDN in your project. A CDN can store content in different formats, which can contribute to faster loading for different users. Because this content is readily available, it is pushed to users faster than would be the case in a local website server. When you use a CDN on your website, you improve the website's speed through reducing the time taken for information to be requested, retrieved, and sent back to the user. Speed is important, especially for e-commerce websites. Furthermore, because of the way a CDN serves data to users, it consumes less bandwidth across multiple servers. If your hosting is charged based on bandwidth, using a CDN is an easy way of reducing your hosting fee. Also, because a CDN improves a website's loading speed and performance, it improves search engine ranking and search engine optimization. Google prioritizes websites with faster load times and those that are easy to crawl repeatedly. Moreover, a CDN is also ideal when you need to manage website traffic without the site crashing. A large portion of website traffic is static meaning it is not continually changing. A CDN ensures that content is delivered quickly while reducing pressure on the local server. As a result, it reduces downtime. To summarize, including Bootstrap from a CDN can improve your website's load time, lower your bandwidth costs, and enhance your website's SEO. OK. Let's scroll down to CDN via JS Deliver. JS Deliver is a public content delivery network for open source software projects, including packages hosted on GitHub, NPM, and WordPress.org. At the time of making this tutorial, the latest available version of Bootstrap is 5.0.2. In your case, the version number might be different depending on when you're watching this video. First, copy the link tag and paste it into the head section of the index.html file just above the link to our custom CSS file. We can remove that part. Next, copy the script tag and paste it into the body section of the index.html file just above the script tag pointing to our custom JS file. We can remove that part. Next, let's select a font we will use in this application. Go to https colon slash slash fonts dot google dot com and search for the font you like. I like Montserrat. Select the styles you want. Copy the link tag and paste it into the head section of the index.html file 
just below the title. I also want to use icons in this application. There are many free icon sets and toolkits to choose from. In this tutorial, we will use material icons. First, go to https colon slash slash developers dot google dot com slash fonts slash docs slash material underscore icons and scroll down to the section setup method one using via Google fonts. Copy the link tag and paste it into the head section of the index.html file just below the font link. I want to use the outline material icons, not the filled ones, so I will slightly modify this link tag and add the plus sign and the word outline. The default link we just copied allows us to use filled icons, not the outline ones, so I've modified the link to get the version I want. To find the icons to use on our page, go to https colon slash slash fonts dot google dot com slash icons. In the drop down menu, select material icons and make sure that outline version is checked. Here we can search for icons that we would like to use in our portfolio website. Now let's start building the layout of our page. I will remove this heading with the text hello world as we won't need it. First let's add a div tag with a class of container-fluid and px-0. The div tag is typically used as a container for other HTML elements. We want to style it with CSS and that's why we are adding the class attribute. The class attribute is used to point to a class selector in the styles.css file which defines all the styles for a particular HTML element with this specific class assigned to it. Multiple HTML elements can share the same class, meaning that we can use one class name to style multiple HTML elements in the same way. As I've mentioned, Postgres 5 includes a set of predefined CSS classes that we can use to quickly and easily build responsive and mobile-friendly web applications. Here, our div tag will be styled in the way that is described in two bootstrap classes, container-fluid and px-0. The container-fluid is a bootstrap class that provides a full-width container that spans the entire width of the viewport. Think of the viewport as the visible area of a web page on a display device. The px-0 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the padding on the x-axis to zero. This means that we set both the padding on the left and the right side of the div to zero. Next, inside that div, we will have a navbar, which is a navigation header. Below the navbar, we will have a hero section. Next, let's add a main tag. The main tag specifies the main content of a page. The content inside the main tag should be unique to the page. It should not include any content that is repeated across the pages, such as sidebars, navigation links, copyright information, or site logos. Inside the main tag, we will have an about section, a project section, a testimonial section, and a contact section. Finally, below the div, we will have a footer. Okay, let's start with the navbar. Bootstrap's navbar is a responsive navigation header with support for branding, a navigation menu, and the Collapse JavaScript plugin. This plugin is used to show and hide content, and we will use it to toggle the navigation menu on smaller devices. Here in the Bootstrap documentation, you can find different navbar examples that you can use in your projects. You just have to copy the code of a selected navbar and paste it into your index.html file. In this tutorial, instead of copying the entire navbar component from the documentation, we will build the navbar ourselves and discuss all the elements and bootstrap classes that the navbar is composed of. 
First, let's add a nav tag. The nav tag represents a section of a page, the purpose of which is to provide navigation links either within the current document or to the other documents. Examples of navigation sections are menus, tables of contents, and indexes. We will assign a number of bootstrap classes to this nav tag. First, we need the navbar class, which creates a navigation bar. Next, we will add the navbar-expand-lg class. In bootstrap, the navigation bar can extend or collapse depending on the screen size. We use the term breakpoint to define a particular viewport width or height at which a responsive design should change significantly. Booster 5 includes 6 default breakpoints, extra small for extra small size screens where the maximum width of the screen is less than 576 pixels. Small indicated by the class infix sm for small size screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 576 pixels. Medium indicated by the class infix md for medium size screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 768 pixels. Large indicated by the class infix lg for large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels. Extra large indicated by the class infix xl for extra large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1200 pixels. And finally, extra extra large indicated by the class infix xxl for extra extra large screens where the minimal width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1400 pixels. So here a responsive collapsing class navbar-expand-lg stacks the navbar vertically on screens smaller than large that is medium, small and extra small but expands the full navbar on large screens and above. In other words, once the user views our portfolio website on a screen with a width of 992 pixels and above, they will see the full navbar with the navigation menu. On smaller devices, they will see the hamburger menu icon. Once they click on this icon, they can hide and show the navigation menu. Ok, next, we will add the navbar-light class so that our navbar has a light background color and dark text. Finally, let's also add the shadow class so that we will have a nice little shadow under the navbar. Inside the nav tag, we will add the div tag with a class of container-fluid and inside that div an anchor tag. The anchor tag is used to create a hyperlink to websites, files, email addresses, locations on the same page, and so on. Let's add the navbar-brand class to the anchor tag. This is a bootstrap class that we add to a link or a header element inside the navbar to represent the logo of a company, product, or project name. I will also add the href attribute to the anchor tag and set its value to a forward slash so that once the user clicks on the logo of our portfolio website, they will be redirected to the home page. So how our logo should look like? I want to display an icon and text. I will search for the important devices icon, copy the span tag and paste it inside the anchor tag. I will also add a margin of one on the right side of the icon Below the icon, I will add the text pub developer. Now let's add some custom CSS. In the styles.css file, we will define a few additional style rules for our portfolio website that are not covered by Bootstrap. But it will be very little additional CSS since using Bootstrap alone, we can build the layout of the page and define spacing, colors, 
and other elements that make our web page look exactly the way we want it to look. In CSS, each style row is composed of two main parts, a selector that specifies which HTML element is the target of the row, and a declaration block that specifies how properties of the selected target should be styled. A style row begins with the selector followed by the declaration block within a pair of curly braces. Selectors are patterns used to select one or more HTML elements that we want to style. This one here is a type selector, also known as an element selector, that selects HTML elements with a given tag name and applies the same styles to each element with that tag name. The type selector begins with a tag name to match. Then we define the CSS properties within the curly braces. Here we have the body tag, but we could also use the type selector to style HTML elements that occur multiple times within a page, like a P tag representing a paragraph, for example. In that case, the same styles would be applied to all paragraphs. What we can see here is a class selector that selects HTML elements containing a class attribute that has been assigned a value matching the selector. The class selector begins with a dot followed by a class name to match. Then we define the CSS properties within the curly braces. As I've already mentioned, multiple HTML elements can share the same class, meaning that we can use one class name to style multiple HTML elements in the same way. This CSS selector is called a child selector and it allows us to select all elements that are children of a parent element. The selector first specifies the parent element, which is navbar-brand, then we add a right angle bracket followed by the child element which is material-icons-outlined. The anchor tag with the class of navbar-brand is the parent element, and the span with the icon located inside that anchor tag is the child element. Therefore, the style rules defined here will apply to the span tag with the icon. A child selector will target all the child elements of the parent. So, for example, if we had more icons inside that anchor tag, all the icons would be styled the same way. I want the body of the page to have a margin of zero and a padding of zero. I set it that way because I don't want the web browser to apply its default margin and padding around the body. This means that the body of the page will fill the entire screen without any extra space around the page. I will also set the font family to Montserrat, which is the font we've linked in the head section of the index.html file. I will also set the font fallback to sans serif. Ok, let's add style rules for icons. I will set the vertical align property to middle and the line height to 1 pixel. Just a quick note here, all of the various different CSS properties are described in detail in CSS documentation, so if you want to learn more about this topic, I highly recommend checking the documentation. Also, for the icon and the logo, I will set the font size to 40 pixels. Now we can test this out. Click Go Live in the bottom right corner of the status bar in Visual Studio Code to start a server. This action will load our web page in your default web browser. And this is the result. At the top of the page, we have a light navbar. On the left, we have a logo with an icon and text. And below the navbar, we have a nice little shadow. Let's keep the live server running. It will allow for a live reload of the page so that we can see the progress while we are building our portfolio website without refreshing the page in the browser. Now let's focus on the navigation menu. First, I will add a div with the class of container and px-3. The container is a bootstrap class 
that provides a fixed width container with a width determined by the screen size and sets the max width property at each of the six bootstrap breakpoints we discussed earlier. The PX-3 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the padding on the x-axis to 3. This means that we set both the padding on the left and the right side of the div to 3. Inside that div, I will add another div with the class of collapse and navbar-collapse and an ID of navbar supported content. The collapse is a bootstrap class indicating collapsible content which can be hidden and shown on demand. The navbar-collapse is a bootstrap class used to collapse the navbar so that, on smaller devices, the user will see the hamburger menu icon and once they click on it, they will be able to hide and show the navigation menu. We need to place the navigation menu inside the div with these bootstrap classes since we want the navbar to be responsive and to hide and show the navigation menu depending on the screen size of a device. Inside the div, let's add an unordered list. This list will hold menu items. We will assign three bootstrap classes to this UL tag. First, the class navbar-nav, which is a bootstrap class used to create full height, lightweight navigation that includes support for dropdowns. This class, used on an unordered list, indicates that the list contains list items with links inside the navigation bar. Let's also add two spacing utility classes so that we can modify the appearance of the menu items. The ms-auto class means margin start auto. Margin start in the left to right web design means margin left and in the right to left design means margin right. The right to left design in a web development context means making your website compatible with languages such as Arabic, Hebrew, Persian and Urdu, which are all written from right to left. In our case, since we use English, we have a left to right website and ms also indicates the left margin set to auto. When we set the margin to auto, then the web browser calculates the margin. The my-lg-0 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the margin on the y-axis to 0 on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels. Spacing utilities that apply to all six bootstrap breakpoints that we discussed earlier have no breakpoint abbreviation in them. This is because those classes are applied from the minimum width of 0 and up and therefore are not bound by a media query. The remaining breakpoints, however, do include a breakpoint abbreviation. Ok, inside the unordered list, we need to add list items. Each list item starts with the li tag. Inside the list item, we will add an anchor tag indicating a hyperlink. To each list item, we need to add the nav-item class and to each anchor tag, we need to add the nav-link class. I will also add the me-lg-3 class to the anchor tag. The me-lg-3 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the margin end to 3 on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels. The margin end in the left to right web design means margin right and in the right to left design means margin left. In our case, since we use English, we have a left to right website and ME indicates the right margin. The first menu item I want is home. I will also add the href attribute to the anchor tag and set its value to a forward slash so that once the user clicks on this menu item, they will be redirected to the home page. I want to have four more menu items corresponding to the various sections of the portfolio website, so we can copy the list item and paste it below four times. The second menu item is about. 
I will set the href attribute to hash sign about, so that once the user clicks on this menu item, they will be redirected to the section of the page with an ID of about. This one here is the ID selector that selects an HTML element with a given ID attribute. The ID attribute specifies a unique ID for an HTML element. We can have more than one element with the same ID in an HTML document. So by definition, the style rules defined by the CSS ID selector will always match only one HTML element. The third menu item is projects. I will set the href attribute to hash sign projects. Next, we have testimonials. I will set the href attribute to hash sign testimonials. And finally, contact. I will set the href attribute to hash sign contact. There is one more element that we need to add to our navbar. We need to add a button with the hamburger menu icon that will be visible on smaller devices. Once the user clicks on this button, they can hide and show the navigation menu. I will add this button here in the code, between the logo and the menu. First, let's add to this button the class of navbar-toggler. The navbar-toggler is a bootstrap class used with the Collapse JavaScript plugin. As I've already mentioned, Bootstrap includes JavaScript plugins that allow us to easily add to our websites toggleable hidden elements, models, tooltips, and more. JavaScript in Bootstrap is HTML first, which means that we can use JavaScript just by adding data attributes to our HTML elements, since nearly all of Bootstrap's JavaScript plugins include a data API. The first data attribute that we will add here to this button is the data-bs-toggle. I will set the value of this attribute to collapse. The data-bs-toggle attribute indicates a collapsible element, and we use it when we want to hide a section and make it appear only when a button is clicked. Next, I will add the attribute data-bs-target. The data-bs-target attribute accepts a CSS selector. I will set it to hash sign navbar supported content. This indicates that the target is this section right here, inside the div with the ID of navbar supported content. This is the part of the navbar that we want to hide on smaller devices. Next, I will add the area-controls attribute and set it to navbar supported content. The area-controls attribute identifies the element the presence of which is controlled by the element on which the attribute is set. So, in our case, the div here with the ID of navbar supported content. Next, I will add the area-expanded attribute and set it to false. The area-expanded attribute is set on an element to indicate if a control is expanded or collapsed and whether or not its child elements are displayed or hidden. Finally, I will add the area-label attribute and set it to toggle navigation. The area-label attribute defines a string value that the labels an interactive element, in our case, the button. Inside this button, we need to add the menu icon. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Great, we have the navbar with a logo and a navigation menu. The navbar is fully responsive, and once we decrease the size of the screen, we can see the hamburger menu icon. Once we click on this icon, we can hide and show the navigation menu. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the hero section of the page. First, 
let's add a header tag. The header tag is typically used as a container for the head section of a website. Next, we will add the bg-light class so that our hero section has a light background color and dark text. Let's also add the py-5 class, which is a bootstrap utility class that sets the padding on the y-axis to 5. This means that we set both the padding on the top and the bottom of the header tag to 5. Inside the header tag, let's add a div with the class of container and px-5. The container is a bootstrap class that provides a fixed width container with a width determined by the screen size and sets the max width property at each of the six bootstrap breakpoints we discussed earlier. The px-5 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the padding on the x-axis to 5. This means that we set both the padding on the left and the right side of the div to 5. Inside that div, let's add another div and assign two bootstrap classes to it. In bootstrap, a div with the row class is used mainly to hold columns in it. Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page, and the column classes indicate the number of columns we would like to use out of the possible 12 columns per row. Let's also add align-items-center. The align-items-center is a bootstrap class that controls the vertical alignment of a single row of flex items. When we use this class, the items will be aligned in the center of the screen. The hero section will be split into two parts. On the left, we will have a short description and two buttons, while on the right, we will have an image. Therefore, we need to add two div tags, one for the content on the left and the other for the content on the right of the hero section. Bootstrap's grid system uses a series of containers, rows and columns to lay out and align content. This grid system is built with flex bugs and it is fully responsive. As I've already mentioned, Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page and the column classes indicate the number of columns we would like to use out of the possible 12 columns per row. Bootstrap's grid system includes six tiers of predefined classes for building complex responsive layouts. We can customize the size of our columns on extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, or extra extra large devices however we see fit. Okay, so let's add three bootstrap classes to the first div. Call-lg-8 Call-xl-7 and Call-xxl-6 The Call-lg-8 class means that on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels, this div will span 8 out of 12 columns. The call-xl-7 class means that on extra large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1200 pixels, this div will span 7 out of 12 columns. The call-xxl-6 class means that on extra extra large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1400 pixels, this div will span 6 out of 12 columns. So the number of columns will decrease as the screen size increases. Let's also add three bootstrap classes to the second div call-xl-5, call-xxl-6, and justify-content-center. The call-xl-5 class means that on extra-large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1200 pixels, 
this div will span 5 out of 12 columns. The call dash xxl dash 6 class means that on extra extra large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 1400 pixels, this div will span 6 out of 12 columns. So the number of columns will increase as the screen size increases. The justify dash content dash center is a bootstrap class that controls the alignment of flex items. When we use this class, the items will be displayed in the center of a flex container on the screen. Inside the first div, you will have the left side of the hero section, a short description and two buttons. Inside the second div, you will have the right side of the hero section, an image. Ok, let's start building the left side of the hero section. First, let's add a div with the class of my-5. The my-5 class is a bootstrap utility class that sets the margin on the y-axis to 5. This means that we set both the margin on the top and the bottom of the div tag to 5. Inside that div, I will add a heading with the class of text-center, fw-bold and mb-2. Inside the heading, I will add the text, hi, I am Bob. The text-center class will align text inside that heading tag to the center. The fw-bold class will set the font weight of the text inside the heading to bold. The mb-2 is a bootstrap class that sets the margin bottom to 2 so that we'll have a little margin at the bottom of the heading. Below, I will add another heading and assign 4 bootstrap classes to it. Text-primary, text-center, fw-bold, and mb-2. Inside the heading, I will add the text, a full-stack web developer. The text-primary class will set the color of the text inside the heading to blue. The other three are the same classes as in the heading above. Next, let's add a p tag that represents a paragraph. Inside that p tag, I will add a short description. I will also assign three bootstrap classes to this paragraph. Lead, text-muted, and mb-4. The lead is a bootstrap class that increases the font size and line height of a paragraph so that it stands out from regular paragraphs. The text-muted class will set the color of the text inside the paragraph to gray. Below the description in the hero section, I want to have two buttons. So let's add a div tag and assign four bootstrap classes to it. d-grid, gap-3, d-sm-flex, and justify-content Dash center. The two buttons will be placed inside this div. The d-grid is a bootstrap utility class that makes the div a grid container. The gap-3 class will set the size of the gap between grid columns to 3. The d-flex class is a bootstrap class used to create a flexbox container and to transform its direct children into flex items. Here we are adding the d-sm-flex class, so we want to apply it only to small and extra small screens where the width of the screen is 576 pixels or less. On small and extra small screens, the two buttons inside the div will be displayed vertically on top of each other. The justify-content-center class will set the buttons inside the div to be displayed in the center of that div. Ok, now we can add the two buttons. First, 
Let's add an A tag and assign four bootstrap classes to it. btn, btn-primary, btn-lg, and text-uppercase. The btn is a bootstrap class that creates a basic button. The btn-primary class is used to create a blue button. We use the btn-lg class when we want a larger button than the default size. We can use the btn bootstrap classes with button, input and anchor tags. And finally, the text-uppercase is a bootstrap class that will make the text on the button uppercase. I will set the href attribute to hash sign about so that once the user clicks on this button, they will be redirected to the section of the page with an ID of about. Inside the A tag, I will add the text learn more and an icon. I will search for the help outline icon, copy the span tag and paste it inside the A tag just below the text. I will also add a margin of 2 on the left side of the icon. We will have two buttons in the hero section, so I will copy this code snippet, paste it below and modify it. I will change the btn-primary class to btn-outline-primary so that we will have a button with a light background, blue border and blue text. I will change the text to view my work. I will also set the href attribute to hash sign projects so that once the user clicks on this button, they will be redirected to the section of the page with an ID of projects. Finally, I will also change the icon to manage search. Ok, we've completed the left side of the hero section. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Great. Everything is working as expected. We have the hero section. On the left, we have a short description and two buttons. The hero section is fully responsive and on small and extra small screens, the two buttons are displayed vertically on top of each other. Now let's focus on building the right side of the hero section. Inside this div here, I will add an image tag and assign three bootstrap classes to it. img-fluid, rounded-3, and my-5. Images in bootstrap are made responsive with the img-fluid class. This class applies to an image a max width of 100% and the height of auto so that the image scales with the parent element. In our case, the parent element is this div here. The rounded-3 is a bootstrap utility class that allows us to easily round the corners of an element. The my-5 class sets the margin on the y-axis to 5. This means that we set both the margin on the top and the bottom of the div tag to 5. The image tag has two required attributes. The src attribute, which specifies a path to the image, and the alt attribute, which specifies an alternate text for the image if the image, for some reason, can be displayed. I will add the src attribute and set the path to the image. If you want to use the same image in your hero section, you can find it in the project's github repository. The repository is linked in the description section below. I will set the alt attribute to hero image. Ok, we've completed the hero section of our portfolio website. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Great, the hero section is split into two parts. On the left, we have a short description and two buttons, while on the right we have an image. 
The hero section is also fully responsive. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the About section of the page. In the About section, you can introduce yourself, describe your skills and experience, and the services you offer your clients. First, let's add a section tag. The section tag represents a generic standalone section of a document, which doesn't have a more specific semantic element to represent it. I will add the ID of About and two bootstrap classes text-center and py-5. Inside the section tag, let's add a div tag with the class of container and py-5. Inside this div, let's add another div with the class of row and justify-content-center. Just a quick note here. We've already discussed all these bootstrap classes earlier in this tutorial, so I will not repeat that information here. When during coding we encounter a new bootstrap class that has not yet been seen in this tutorial, I will explain it in detail. Ok, inside the second div, I will add a heading with the class of fw-bold. Inside the heading, I will add the text about. Below the heading, let's add the p tag with the class of lead, text-muted, and mb-5. Inside this paragraph, we can add a short description. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Ok, we now have a section heading and a short description below. As I've mentioned, the about section will be split into three columns. Each column will include a title, a short description and an icon. Ok, let's add a div tag with the class of container and mp-5. Inside this div, let's add another div with the class of row. The about section will be split into three columns. As I've already mentioned, Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page and the column classes indicate the number of columns we would like to use out of the possible 12 columns per row. Let's add a div that will hold the first of the three columns in the About section. I will also add three bootstrap classes to this div. Call-lg-4, mx-auto, and mb-5. The call-lg-4 class means that on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels, this div will span 4 out of 12 columns. Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page, so we will have 3 div tags with this class for the 3 columns since 4 times 3 gives us 12. On smaller screens, the three columns in the About section will be displayed vertically, on top of each other. The mx-auto is a bootstrap utility class that sets the margin on the x-axis to auto. This means that we set both the margin on the left and the right side of the div to auto. When we set the margin to auto, then the web browser calculates the margin. The mb-5 is a bootstrap class that sets the margin bottom to 5. Let's add a div with the class of d-flex and mv-5. I'll also add a custom class called about. The style rules for the about class will be defined in the styles.css file. Inside that div, I will add an icon. I will search for the palette icon, copy the span tag, and paste it inside the div tag. I will also add two bootstrap classes to this icon, m-auto and text-primary. I want to make the icon quite large, so I will set the font size to a specific value in the styles.css file. We will use here a CSS child selector that allows us to select all elements that are children 
of a parent element. The selector first specifies the parent element, which is the class about. Then we add a right angle bracket followed by the child element, which is the class material-icons-outline. The div tag with the class of about is the parent element and the span with the icon located inside that div tag is the child element. Therefore, the style rules defined here will apply to the span tag with the icon. I will set the font size of the icon to 50 pixels. Below the icon, we will have a title, so I will add a heading with the text design. Below the title, we will have a short description. So let's add a paragraph tag with the class of text-muted and mb-0 and some short description inside the paragraph tag. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. OK, we now have the first of the three columns in the About section. Let's copy this entire code snippet and paste it below two times since we need two more columns. In the second column, I will change the icon to code and the title to development. I will also change the description inside the P tag. In the third column, I will change the icon to settings and the title to launch and maintenance. I will also change the description inside the P tag. OK, we have completed the about section of our portfolio website. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running so let's head to the browser. We have a section heading and a short description below. The About section is split into three columns. Each column includes a title, a short description and an icon. The About section is also fully responsive. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the project section of the page. The project section will be split into three columns. Each project will include an image, a project name, a description, tags, and a link to a GitHub repository that we can access by clicking the source code button. First, let's add a section tag with the ID of projects and two bootstrap classes, text-center and py-5. At the top of the project section, we will have a section heading and a short description below. It will look the same as the heading and description in the about section, so we can copy that code snippet and paste it inside the section tag. I will change the section name to projects and also modify the description. As I've mentioned, the project section will be split into three columns, one column for one project. Each project will include an image, a project name, a description, tags, and a source code button. OK, let's add a div tag with the class of container and mp-5. Inside this div, let's add another div with the class of row. The project section will be split into three columns. As I've already mentioned, Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page and the column classes indicate the number of columns we would like to use out of the possible 12 columns per row. Let's add a div that will hold the first of the three columns in the project section. I will also add three Bootstrap classes to this div. Col-lg-4 mx-auto and mb-5. The call-lg-4 class means that on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels, this div will span 4 out of 12 columns. Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page, so we'll have three div tags with this class for the three columns since 4 times 3 gives us 12. On smaller screens, the three columns in the project section will be displayed vertically 
on top of each other. The MX-Auto is a bootstrap utility class that sets the margin on the x-axis to auto. This means that we set both the margin on the left and the right side of the div to auto. When we set the margin to auto, then the web browser calculates the margin. The MB-5 is a bootstrap class that sets the margin bottom to 5. For each project, we will use a card. Bootstrap's cards are flexible and extensible content containers with multiple variants that include options for headers and footers, a wide variety of content, contextual background colors, and various display options. First, let's add a div tag with five Bootstrap classes. Card, H-100, Shadow-LG, Border-0, and bg light. The card is a bootstrap class that creates a card container. The h-100 will set the height to 100% of the div. The shadow-lg class will add a shadow under the card. The border-0 class will remove the border on all four sides of the element. The bg light class We'll set the background color of our card to light, and we'll have dark text. Inside the div, I will add an image tag with a class of card-img-top. I will add the src attribute and set the path to the image. I will also add the alt attributes and set it to project1. The card-img-top is a bootstrap class that places an image on the top of the card. Below the image, let's add a div tag with the class of card-body and p-4. The card-body is a bootstrap class that is a building block of a card. We use this class when we need a padded section within a card. The p-4 class will add a padding of 4 on all four sides of the div. Inside the div, I will add a heading with two bootstrap classes, card-title and mb-3. Inside the heading, I will add the text cryptocurrency dashboard. The card-title is a bootstrap class that is used to create a card title and align it nicely inside the card body. The mb-3 is a bootstrap class that sets the margin bottom to 3. Below the heading, let's add a div with the class of mb-2. Inside that div, we will place tags describing the project. For this purpose, we will use Bootstrap's badges. A badge in Bootstrap is a small count and labeling component. I will add a div with the class of badge, bg-primary, and rounded dash pill, and inside that div, I will add the text Django. The badge is a bootstrap class that creates a simple gray circular badge. The bg primary class adds a blue background color to an element. The rounded dash pill is a bootstrap class that we use to make badges more rounded with a larger border radius. We need three badges, so let's copy this div and paste it below two times. In the second div, I will change the text to React, and in the third, to Material UI. Below the div, with the class of MB-2, let's add a paragraph with the class of Card-Text. Inside the P tag, I will add a project description. The card-text is a bootstrap class that is used to add text to the card. Alternatively, text within the card-text class can also be styled with the standard HTML tags. Finally, let's add the source code button. Below the div with the class of card-body, let's add a div with the class of card-footer, bg-transparent, and mb-3. 
The card-footer is a bootstrap class that adds a footer to the card. The bg-transparent class will make the background transparent and the element will take the background color from the parent. First, let's add an A tag with four bootstrap classes, btn, btn-outline-primary, btn-sm, and text-uppercase. The btn is a bootstrap class that creates a basic button. The btn-outline-primary class is used to create a button with a light background, blue border, and blue text. We use the btn-sm class when we want a smaller button than the default size. And finally, the text-uppercase is a bootstrap class that will make the text on the button uppercase. I will set the href attribute to a link to the project's GitHub repository. I will also add the target attribute set to blank so that once the user clicks on this button, a GitHub page will open in a new tab in the browser. Inside the A tag, I will add the text source code and an icon. I will search for the code icon copy the span tag and paste it inside the a tag just above the text. I will also add a margin of 1 on the right side of the icon. Now let's add some custom CSS. We will use here a CSS child selector that allows us to select all elements that are children of a parent element. The selector first specifies the parent element which is the class card. Then we add a right angle bracket followed by the child element, which is the image tag. The div tag with the class of card is the parent element and the image tag is the child element. Therefore, the style rules defined here will apply to the image. I will set the height of the image to 250 pixels. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Ok, we now have the first of the three cards in the project section. Let's copy this entire code snippet and paste it below two times since we need two more columns. In the second card, I will change the path to an image and the alt attribute. I will also change the card title to Portfolio Website. Next, I will change the project description. And finally, I will change the href attribute of the source code button to point to the correct GitHub repository. In the third card, I will change the path to an image and the alt attribute. I will also change the card title to Image Classification. Next, I will change the project description. And finally, I will change the href attribute of the source code button to point to the correct GitHub repository. OK, we have completed the project section of our portfolio website. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. We have a section heading and a short description below. The project section is split into three columns. Each project includes an image, a project name, a description, tags, and a link to a GitHub repository that we can access by clicking the source code button. The project section is also fully responsive. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the testimonials section of the page. In the testimonials section, you can show your potential clients what other people have said about your work. This section will be split into three columns. First, let's add a section tag with the ID of testimonials and two bootstrap classes, text-center and py-5. At the top of the testimonials section, we will have a section heading and a short description below. It will look the same as the heading and description in the About and Project section, so we can copy that code snippet and paste it inside the section tag. 
I will change the section name to testimonials and also modify the description. As I've mentioned, the testimonial section will be split into three columns. Each column will include a testimonial, client details and an image. Ok, let's add a div tag with the class of container and mp-5. Inside this div, let's add another div with the class of row. The testimonial section will be split into three columns. As I've already mentioned, Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page and the column classes indicate the number of columns we would like to use out of the possible 12 columns per row. Let's add a div that will hold the first of the three columns in the testimonial section. I will also add three Bootstrap classes to this div call-lg-4 mx-auto and mb-5 The call-lg-4 class means that on large screens where the minimum width of the screen is greater than or equal to 992 pixels this div will span 4 out of 12 columns Bootstrap's grid system allows up to 12 columns across the page, so we'll have three div tags with this class for the three columns since 4 times 3 gives us 12. On smaller screens, the three columns in the testimonial section will be displayed vertically on top of each other. The mx-auto is a Bootstrap utility class that sets the margin on the x-axis to auto. This means that we set both the margin on the left and the right side of the div to auto. When we set the margin to auto, then the web browser calculates the margin. The mb-5 is a bootstrap class that sets the margin bottom to 5. Let's add a div with 5 bootstrap classes, text-center, fs-4, fst-italic, mb-4, and px-2. The fs-4 is a bootstrap utility class that sets the font size to 4. The fst-italic class sets the font style to italics. Inside that div, I will add a testimonial from a client. Below the div with the testimonial, let's add a div with the class of d-flex, align-items-center, and justify-content-center. I will also add a custom class called testimonial. The style rules for the testimonial class will be defined in the styles.css file. Inside that div, I will add an image tag with a class of rounded-circle and me-3. I will add the src attribute and set the path to the image. I will also add the alt attribute and set it to user1. I want the image to have a fixed height and width, so I will add new style rules in the styles.css file. We will use here a CSS child selector that allows us to select all elements that are children of a parent element. The selector first specifies the parent element, which is the class testimonial. Then we add a right angle bracket followed by the child element which is the image tag. The div tag with the class of testimonial is the parent element and the image tag located inside that div tag is the child element. Therefore, the style rules defined here will apply to the image. I will set the height and width of the image to 50 pixels. Below the image tag, let's add a div with the class of fw-bold. Inside that div, I will first add the name of a client and then below I will add a span tag. Inside the span tag, I will add a forward slash that separates the client's name and company. I will assign two bootstrap classes to that span tag, text-primary and mx-1. Below the span tag, I will add the client's role and company. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Okay, 
We now have the first of the three columns in the testimonial section. Let's copy this entire code snippet and paste it below two times since we need two more columns. In the second column, I will change the path to an image and the alt attribute. I will also change the client's name and company. In the third column, I will also change the path to an image, the alt attribute and the client's name and company. OK, we have completed the testimonial section of our portfolio website. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. We have a section heading and a short description below. The testimonial section is split into three columns. Each column includes a testimonial, client details and an image. The testimonial section is also fully responsive. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the contact section of the page. The contact section will be split into two parts. On the left, we will have a map and on the right, we will have contact information such as an address, phone number and email. First, let's add a section tag with the ID of contact and two bootstrap classes, text-center and py-5. At the top of the contact section, we will have a section heading and a short description below. It will look the same as the heading and description in the About, Projects and Testimonials section, so we can copy that code snippet and paste it inside the section tag. I will change the section name to Contact and also modify the description. As I've mentioned, the contact section will be split into two parts. On the left, we will have a map and on the right, we will have contact information. OK, let's add a div tag with the class of container and mp-5. Inside this div, let's add another div with the class of row. The contact section will be split into two parts. Therefore, we need to add two div tags one for the content on the left and the other for the content on the right of the contact section. OK, let's add a div with three bootstrap classes, call-xl-5, call-xxl-6 and mb-5. Below, let's add a second div with four bootstrap classes, call-lg-8, call-xl-6, dash seven, call dash XXL dash six and MB dash five. Inside the first div, we will have a map created using Leaflet. Leaflet is an open source JavaScript library for creating mobile friendly interactive maps. It's a good alternative to Google Maps since it's completely free. First, we need to include the Leaflet library within our HTML page. Go to https colon slash slash leafletjs.com slash download dot html and scroll down to the section using a hosted version of leaflet. First, copy the link tag and paste it into the head section of the index.html file just above the link to the bootstrap CSS file. We can remove that part. Next, copy the script tag and paste it into the body section of the index.html file just above the script tag pointing to the bootstrap.js file. We can remove that part. Now let's check how we can add a map to our page. On the Leaflet website, go to Tutorials and open this one, Leaflet Quick Start Guide. We've already included the CSS and JS files in the index.html file, so we can move to the third step of the instruction. Let's copy this div tag with the ID of map and paste it inside this div here. Next, we need to define a fixed height for the map container. We can do it in the styles.css file. This one here is the ID selector that selects an HTML element with a given ID attribute. The ID attribute specifies a unique ID for an HTML element. 
we can have more than one element with the same ID in an HTML document. So by definition, the style rules defined by the CSS ID selector will always match only one HTML element. In contrast, the class selector and the type selector can both match multiple HTML elements. I will set the height of the map to 300 pixels. Next, we need to set up the map. Copy this code and paste it into the scripts.js file. First, we need to set the latitude and longitude of our location on the map. You can google this information for your address. I will search for Dublin, Ireland latitude and longitude. Copy the values and paste them into the code, here, between the square brackets. First the latitude and then the longitude. The rest of the code can stay the same. If you want to learn more about the leaflet library, I recommend checking the documentation on the leaflet's website. Ok, we've completed the left side of the contact section. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Great, everything is working as expected. We have a section heading and a short description below. On the left side of the contact section, we have a map that correctly shows Dublin, Ireland. The contact section is fully responsive. Now let's focus on building the right side of the contact section. First, let's add a div tag with the class of mb-5. We will need three div tags. The first div will hold the address, the second will hold the phone number, and the third will hold the email. Inside the first div, let's add a heading with the class of text-uppercase and mb-2. Inside the heading, I will add the text address. Below, let's add the p tag with the class of lead and mb-0. Inside the p tag, I will add the text Dublin, Ireland. Let's copy this entire div and paste it below two times. In the second div, I will change the heading to phone and add a phone number inside the p tag. In the third div, I will change the heading to email and add an email address inside the p tag. Ok, we've completed the contact section of our portfolio website. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Great. The contact section is split into two parts. On the left we have a map, while on the right we have contact details. The contact section is also fully responsive. Everything is working as expected. Now we can focus on building the last part of the page, the footer. First, let's add a footer tag with the class of text-center and py-4. The footer tag defines a footer of a page document or section, and it typically contains information about the author, copyright data, or links to related documents. Inside the footer tag, let's add a div with the class of container, px-5, and mb-2. Inside this div, I will add the copyright information, ampersand, copy, semicolon, is an HTML entity representing the copyright symbol. Now let's check what the page looks like after the changes. The live server is still running, so let's head to the browser. Ok, we now have the footer section. Let's add one more thing to our portfolio website, an HR tag, also known as a horizontal rule, which represents a thematic break between sections or paragraph level elements. Let's add the HR tag between the About and Project sections, between the Projects and Testimonials sections, between the Testimonials and Contact sections, and finally, between the Contact and Footer sections. Now, let's check what the page looks like after the changes. Ok, we now have dividers between different sections of our website. 
the layout of the page is fully responsive and it automatically adapts when we resize the browser window. We've now completed our portfolio website and we've learned a lot about HTML and Bootstrap 5 and a little bit about pure CSS. We hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel so you can be notified whenever we post something new. It really helps with the algorithm to get our videos out there to more and more people so that we can continue making them. We really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.